and welcome to Trials to Triumphs. I'm Ashley Blaine Featherson Jenkins, but you can call me ABFJ. This week, my fellow HU alum, author, and founder of Well Read Black Girl, Glory Edom, talks to me about building and sustaining legacy. Glory and I spent most of our conversation reminiscing on the lasting impact of Howard University. For Glory, HU provided the freedom to take up space and cultivate her identity while creating a legacy marked by Black excellence. There would be no well-read Black girl without me going to Howard because I was really trying to like capture that feeling, that essence in the book club because there's no white gaze at Howard University and there's no white gaze in Well-Read Black Girl, we are doing this for us, by us. Like we are creating the space and being so loving and nurturing and cultivating it without this idea of we're performing or trying to get the approval of anyone else. Hi, Glory, welcome to the pod. Thank you for having me. Hi, Ashley. I'm so excited to chat with my fellow Howard alum. H-U. You know. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to homecoming? Of course. I'm actually based in D.C. Do you go every year? I have, oh, I have okay, taken great. breaks. I'm gone and then I've taken a break and then I've come back. Like during the pandemic, I had a slow, I mean, everybody had a slow down, but I like. Well, yeah. Yeah. But this year, definitely okay. I'm going to be there. Are you going? Oh, okay. No, well. We'll see. I always like sometimes something always pops up when I have to go, but I try to just go for like anniversary years, whether it's like for my sorority or like graduation year and stuff like that. Um, just because I'm in LA, so it's not like I can just like roll up. Like it's a whole situation. Yeah, right. Yeah, I'm like I'm down the street, so I have no excuse. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I love homecoming. Like it's one of the best things. Like I, I always tell people like. You have to experience it at some point in your life, oh, Howard absolutely. Homecoming. It's like no other. It's so special. You leave changed. Yep. It's like my husband, he talks about it once a month. He's like, oh, man, I loved Howard Homecoming. Like, he, it just was one of his fa the best time in his life. So, yeah. I love Homecoming. It just also is the space where you can, like, revisit your old self. Every time I go on campus, mm. I'm just like, oh, I was a freshman year. Like, this is what I was doing. This is what I was feeling. And now I'm in this new phase. It's like a new evolution. Now I'm looking forward to bringing my son to homecoming games. I'm like, oh. what is that going to be like? And hopefully like planting the seed, like you too will go here one day soon, you know? So oh, I'm, I'm excited goodness. just like for the next evolution of what homecoming means now. You know, you and I have not met in person, but I have become a huge fan uh, of your work and of your um, energy that you're putting into the world, uh, especially as it pertains to Black women. And, you know, I came across your work on Instagram and I remember seeing it and, uh, you know, growing up, my dad always wanted me to be a big reader mm -hmm. and I wasn't. My dad's an avid reader. He reads like six books a week or something. And he always has my entire life. And I think he really, really, I know he really, really wanted that for me as a mm -hmm. child. And I appreciated books and education and learning uh, and reading, but I just wasn't really into it in the way that he was. But um, something about seeing well-read Black girl and what you do sparked inside of me that I am a, a reader. I just became that in at, later in life. Like I became that, I would say in like my late twenties. Mm -hmm. And I just want to say thank you, Glory. I I oh think what you're goodness. doing is absolutely amazing. That is such high praise. I appreciate that because I too feel like we have met before simply because a Howard and b like seeing your beautiful face on TV and all your incredible films oh. and like watching you. You have such a beautiful aura, and it feels like that immediate sister girl type connection. I'm like, okay, I can see her. I can see her, you know, <laughs> on the yard with me. I can see her sitting next to yes. me in my house, you know, just hanging out, taking up my braids, like, you know, all the things. <laughs> yes. Yes. It just is I like a, an immediate kinship. And I think that is what I was trying to facilitate with Well Red Black Girl. Cause mm. it's not about like 
the books that you read. Yes, literature is at the forefront, but it's also about finding your voice and seeing each other Mm -hmm. and having a mirror like reflect, right? It's like, we have been told that there's this canon of books that you're supposed to read. Like, you know, you're supposed to do Shakespeare and Walt Whitman. And it's like, no, actually, I want to do Toni Morrison. I want to do Alice Walker. I want to see reflections of myself in the work. And I want to feel proud. You know, my my first anthology by the same name, Well Read Black Girl, it was really about finding your voice and discovering who you are. And I had this like central question about You know, when did you first see yourself and seeing yourself in a book or any kind of art, like whether it's a film or music or visual art, like once you see yourself, something like really unlocks in your soul and you can feel affirmed and you feel like this surge of um, just like power. Like when I Mm -hmm. when I read something that I feel proud of or I like read a poem that moves me to laughter or tears, there's something in me that just opens up further. And I'm like, I belong here. I'm, you know, I deserve to take up space. And that's what I'm always yes. trying to really like show on Well Red Black Girl. It's like, it's not just about the books. It's about us as Black women and knowing that we deserve mm-hmm. to be in any space, in any industry, you know, and especially when it comes to the creative arts, like we need to always show up for one another and hold space for one another. You know, just as you were saying that, I'm like, you know, Black women, we are art. We are art. Yep. And the way that we walk and the way that we talk and the way that we move and the and, and our the vastness of our complexions, like every our hair, what our hair can do, right. all of these things to me uh, is art. And and I know that you feel the same way. So I'm really excited for this conversation because uh, I think in a, in a lot of ways we're kindred spirits and and uh, mm-hmm. we we see the world and we have a mission to uplift, empower, and fully see Black women in everything that we do. Yeah. Um, and I and I completely honor you for that, Glory. Thank truly, L- let's chat about Howard University. What did Howard give you? I love that question so much. Howard gave me so much. So first, I would say confidence. I walked onto mm-hmm. that campus and felt this um, this ability of like, I can do this. I can do anything that I set my mind to, anything that um, I dream, I can make my life bigger. And it was being surrounded by so many people that looks like me, that had the same aspirations, that held the same ambition. So that was like the first thing. I just felt immediately confident as a young Black woman on Howard's campus. The next thing Mm -hmm. for sure was an abundance of friendships. The friendships that I made at Howard have been lifelong. They have been affirming. They've like seen me through different stages of my life. So, you know, those friendships always made me feel just like, empowered. And lastly, I would say legacy, like being Mm -hmm. part of that, um, just being part of just that landscape to say that I went to Howard along with Sora Neale Hurston and I went to Howard along with Ashley, you know, and, and, you know, Diddy, we can count him too. (laughs) You know what I mean? Just like, come on, Diddy. Just like all these like amazing, amazing, incredible people that come from this long lineage of history and love and like black excellence that, that in itself is, has just been and you, and you have this immediate recognition. I remember being at a publishing event that was predominantly white. At the time, I had really just started Well Read Black Girl, and I was like still trying to figure it out. You know, a lot of times people kind of stop it at like, oh, she's like a book Instagrammer. And the reality is I edit. I do a lot of things behind the scenes mm-hmm. to make sure, you know, I'm producing a festival. There's a lot of like hard work that goes on beyond just the Instagram account. And I was in this room. I had been invited. It was very high profile. It was for Ta-Nehisi Coates. And, and I was, I felt, I felt real, a little shy. Like I felt like a little out of place being in this space. And, um, and of course, Ta-Nehisi, H-U. Like I was like, how yes. like all the way. Um, but I didn't know if he would know who I was, if he would approach me. I like I had no idea. And I kid you not, like he walks across the room and like goes past all these VP C like publishers, like parts the sea to come say hello to me. And I just mm. was like, oh my gosh, like I felt so honored to, that he it was when his book Water Dancer published. 
I was just Mm -hmm. so honored at the fact that he acknowledged me and, and just was like so kind. And afterwards, everyone was just on, they were like, how do you know him? Like, how did he say hello? And I was like, Howard University, we went to the same school. Like, he's he's amazing he's an amazing person amazing writer journalist all the things but he's also a howard alum and that like takes priority and so all of that to be able to show up in a room and say like i belong here too because i went to school with this i think we're not the same time he's older than me but you know what i mean yes. we, went to, like, we both went to howard that is our alma mater like I'm really, really proud of that. I'm really proud to be part yeah. of that legacy. And I like, I wish that for so many young people, especially, no matter what HBC you go to, you know, whether it's Howard or Spelman, you know, like, like all these incredible schools, there's something about knowing who you are and not being tokenized, not being pit against one another. Mm. Like it, Howard just embodies just so much nurturement and love. And I know I could be like in Europe on vacation and and see like a Howard alum and it's like connection, like, you know, you know what I mean? Like automatically. It's always love. It's always love. It's always love. And that really sustains me. So all those things, I never, that I think that was like the best. And I, I made some pretty crazy choices in my youth, but going to Howard was one of like the, Mm. the greatest ones. It changed my life. It really did. Ditto. I, I mean, Yes to everything you said, and and I I strongly agree. And I think, you know, what I was thinking about when you talked about uh, seeing your fellow alum at this at this amazing event is that what we all have in common is that Howard came before all the things. Yes, we were yes. first just students at Howard before we were accomplished authors and journalists and actors and festival producers and and mothers and fathers and whatever, all of the things, mm-hmm. we were just first students on the yard. Yeah. And I think that that's like the collective energy that that we always feel is that like, we because we all know that we were students on the yard first and we all know what that means. Yes, yes. And I almost think that we don't, we all know what it means and we all have a word for it that we can't quite vocalize because it's that special. It's yeah. that nuanced. It's, it's like that, we, It's just a knowing. Yeah. It's an essence. It's an essence that like you just have to be there to feel. But it it preceded everything else in our – most of the big things in our lives. No, I'll say. I, would, I 100% – Agree. And I, I, I'm, I'm so glad that like, you're also struggling to like figure out that feeling because <laughs> every time I'm telling, you know, I'm recommending someone go to Howard, like it's hard to put into words. It's just like, you'll know when you get there, like you'll feel it once you're on campus, when you're in the classroom, when you're having these conversations, the debates and like, the, oh. just like the, all the conversations that I was so intensely involved in and like all, all these things, it just made sense once it just it just made sense on on campus like it made sense and i was able to take that feeling into other areas of my life and say that like yeah. okay and in really real talk like there would be no well read black girl without me going to howard because i was really uh. trying to like capture that feeling that essence in the book club because you know what's so special about it it's like there's no white gaze at howard university and there's no white gaze In well-read black girl, like we are doing this for us by us. Like we are creating the space and it's and and being so loving and nurturing and cultivating it without this idea of we're performing or trying to get the approval of anyone else. There's no need for the validation of anyone Mm -hmm. else. And so that it's hard to put into words, but it is a thing that we're all we're all holding on to and we're all trying to capture at all times. Um, yeah. It's beautiful. And it's so, so special. It's like, beautiful. It's so, so special. Like, I'm like, everyone's and on I know, Howard. <laughs> I know. And I know that your father also yes. attended Howard University. Yes, he did. My mother attended Howard University. And, and I think that there's also something about, you know, the years that you are in college mm-hmm. are such important years of your life. I would still say some of the most important years of my life, even now being 35, I would say that like still those years, Mm -hmm. everything changed and shifted. And so much of like um, the ideologies that I developed about who I am and what I want and where I'm going, you know, were formed while I was there. And there's something really cool about knowing that like our parents did the same thing 
walking the same yard, going to the same, you know, you know, classrooms and dorms, whatever it may be that, that we did at the same age. Yeah. There was something really beautiful about the fact that I did feel like in a lot of ways I was kind of walking in not only my mother's shoes, but the shoes of, like you said, Zora Neale Hurston and so many other amazing people. Um, there's something really special about that that you can only get at Howard and you can only get it at HBCU too. Yeah. Because uh, we didn't have all the amazing distinguished alum. There's like... Some went to other HBCUs as well, but but most went to Howard. Yeah, like some of them went other places, but I agree. Yeah. Majority of them went to Howard. But you, you know, majority. It's, it's another thing too. I love what you're saying because it makes me think that, in a way, I feel like I cultivated my taste at Howard too. Like there is a, you know, the when you're on campus, the way you dress, the way you have your hair, the way you talk, like how, like you're figuring out your identity and. Also, like the the art that you're drawn to is also it usually is like an indication of what you're missing or what you need in your life too. Mm. So when I was reading certain books, I was very I was like really trying to figure out what it meant to be a feminist, what it meant to really like st- like live my values. And my parents were are incredible people and definitely like offered me so many tools and stories to say like, okay, this is how we think you should do it. And then I got onto campus and I was like, okay, I'm going to do it a little bit more like this. And I like mm-hmm. this. And this is how I want to, you know, I shaved my head when I was on campus. Like I came home. Of my, course my mom you did. I'm not like, at all surprised. <laughs> <laughs> I had like no hair. I was like, my mom was like, what is going on? Like she had like, was completely baffled, but I was, you know, I just was like experimenting and like, you know, and then, you know, Erica Madu was out during that phase. So you couldn't, like, I was bag lady singing the song. I was just like trying to put on all these like parts of my identity and see what fit. And it, it led me to who I am now, but you need that space of like practicing who you want to be and like seeing how it shows up, how it feels. And it's also okay to change your mind. Like I just was trying so many things and it allowed me the freedom to do that and really cultivate who I wanted to be as a person and do it with a, a, like a sense of integrity and knowing that like, I'm not, um, I don't have to perform. I can be myself and I can let go of perfectionism. Because yeah. I would say before I entered college, there was this essence of like trying to be perfect and, you know, like make this, you know, the perfect grades and the perfect like look a certain way. And I, oh my gosh, I wish I could find some pictures. My my little bob that I had when I came onto campus and, you know, wearing my, you know, my little turtlenecks and I could let that all go <laughs> when I like, when I really decided this is who I want to be. I want to be more free. I want to be more creative. And once yeah. I like said, okay, yes, this is who I am. It, like a world opened up. I love that. Look at us now, girl. Look at us now. I, you know, I want to talk about your dad because I, I too am a daddy's girl. I love my dad so much. When you think of your dad, um, what is one of the greatest gifts that he imparted upon you? Oh. And I also want to know, how has it been navigating in the world with him not being on the earthly plane anymore? Oh, man, that's such a great question. What my dad definitely instilled in me is this idea of dreaming big. You know, he was Mm. constantly like really willing both me and my siblings to will the world bigger. So if you had an idea, if you had a project, if you had anything that you wanted to pursue, like you really had to think of all the possibilities of it. And that idea of like dreaming really big and building a world that could be um, just magical. Like my dad was a really great storyteller and he was very funny. I can I can like just hear my dad's laugh now. He just had a mm. really great sense of just like laughing at himself, but also like laughing at just what, just like enjoyment, you know? Like, you know, how some people, they have a really great sense of humor and you hear their laughter and it makes you laugh too. And you're just like, you're not mm-hmm. even sure what what the joy <laughs> is, but you're just like, I'm in on this. And he was always inviting us in to be like, okay, this is our world. And, 
you know, I'm first generation. Both my parents are Nigerian and his idea of the like the diaspora and going to in a black institution and being like he was so immersed of like this is where you belong. This is like who we are. Like we're going to make sure that you have all the opportunities possible. And I want you to like hold that, hold that in your heart. And so my dad really offered this idea of dreaming big and loving yourself through the process too. Like I, I remember growing up, we would go to the monuments and there was this whole thing about like, cause my, my dad was also an architect and he, he would be like, okay, if you could build any monument, like, what would you build? You know, like, what would it look like? And we would, me and my brother would go through this whole thing of just like, okay, oh, we would look like this and it would be this color. Like, we, and this is just like, you know, on the mall of, of mm-hmm. you know, and we would go to see the, um, he really loved going to see the uh, Vietnam Memorial and like, yeah. like seeing, you know, he loved the engravings and stuff. And we would just go to these places and he would ask us questions like, what would you do if you could design it? And what, what would it look like? And it was such a small thing, but to be eight or nine and like having someone really value your opinion and ask you these questions and be taken, I felt like he took us really seriously. Like I would do it this way, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. And it's, it's like that kind of thing. Like when you have a parent or a caregiver that just gives you that, like that devotion and attention. And when you're talking to them, they're like really, truly listening to you. Oh my God, I feel like I'm going to cry. Mm. Yeah. It, you know, I'm, and I think that's what I miss the most because mm-hmm. like, like when I was talking to him, I just felt like he was always like listening, like in such a yeah. deep way and always like, and, and not to, you know, not to like give a response, like, but just to, to just to be like, okay, like, let's think about it. Like, what could, you know, mm-hmm. and I, it, it's hard to like not have that person to really yeah like think through those dreams with and like think through those possibilities because um, that that's what I really miss the most. You know, mm-hmm. my dad was really, really special and did so many incredible things and had so many incredible adventures in his life. And he was really open to sharing those stories with us growing up. So as I yeah. like now that he's not here, I feel like like everything I've done with Well Red Black Girl, I always think like, oh, you know, oh. what would my dad think? And like, you know, how could this, ha- you know, what would he? Just his input would have been. It would I miss that? And as I'm processing my grief and I'm understanding he's not here in a physical sense, he's here with me spiritually, mm-hmm. and I still talk to him, and I have his picture all over my home, mm-hmm. and I I just really try to evoke his presence, and I make sure that my son knows everything possible about his his grandfather and, and you know, this idea of just protecting my father's legacy, yeah. too, you know, so that really comes up for me. Um yeah, my, my dad was awesome. He was really, really special. <laughs> where where are you in processing your grief? Because we talk about grief a lot on the podcast. And I think the thing that is um, the most consistent thing that I've learned about grief is that it's inconsistent with everybody. Everybody experiences yeah. grief differently. Um, and so where are you now in your journey with grief? surrounding losing your father? Oh, that's such a good question. I would say it's been seven years since he's passed and I've gone through different phases. I think the first phase, I immediately got into therapy. I was like, I need to go to therapy yeah. and talk to you know, a professional about what's going on. But in my mind, I thought that was enough. I was like, mm-hmm. okay, s- seven sessions, I have finish this part. I'm good to go. Let me get back to work. You know, like I was never anticipating the triggers and the reminders, like listening to a song and Mm. then being reminded of my dad or seeing a photo or having a holiday or even like sometimes on Instagram seeing, you know, people going through their weddings and their fathers walking them down the aisle or fathers say like, I didn't anticipating and I didn't anticipate all those moments of when the grief would be triggered. And I have learned to figure out different coping mechanisms. And luckily, I had a lot of audio of my dad before he passed. And so <sighs> I listened to I listened to his voice a lot. And I listened to I watch old videos. And um, when I'm really sad, I talk to my brother and we talk about like different memories. And that helps me go through the processing. But the biggest takeaway is learning that it's not final. Like the process Mm -hmm. will be with me lifelong. It's going to be with me forever because I'm going to miss my dad forever. And that's, that's hard, but 
I, I do my best to, I really do my best to honor his legacy. And t- I love talking about mm. him. I really love like bringing up his memory. And I have a good friend. Her name is Sabrina. She has a grief tradition where she writes a letter to her friends. And basically, because her father is also passed, she basically writes um, a letter saying, like telling her friends and family all the things that have happened to her and all the things she wishes she could tell her dad. And so I've also adopted that too, where I'll make a list of like, okay, this year, this happened. Mm. And we went through a pandemic and you have a grandson now. And I went to the Beyonce concert. (laughs) Like, Mm. you know, I just like... I write down all the things that I wish I could tell him. And I really thank her for giving me that, like, uh, that tool because it's been so helpful because a lot of the things, I journal a lot. I mean, obviously, I'm a writer, (laughs) so I write a lot of things and it helps me process stuff. But that practice of sharing these moments and sharing it with, like, close friends and family, that intimate group of people that will, like, cheer you on and recognize that, like, oh, this is a milestone and, you know, all these things are happening. So that has been a really helpful tool for me to kind of cope with things and also put um, the grief in a in a container of sorts where it, can, it doesn't, like, overflow, you know, all the time. It's yeah. like I can sit with it and be okay with it and I can look at it and I can make my list and then I can do something else. You know, it doesn't mm-hmm. overwhelm me. But it's um it's just losing anyone, whether it's a parent or just anyone that you love. Yeah. It's just like such a challenging uh, moment, mm-hmm. you know? And unfortunately society doesn't give room for grief. It doesn't give room for a sacred pause. So you have to be like adamant about creating those traditions and rituals that will bring you into a space of healing. Sacred pause. That was beautiful. I I also just want to honor our friends, like your friend Sabrina, who, who, uh, passed that tradition on to you. My, one of my dearest friends, Logan, um, she lost her dad um, some years ago, and she recently, this was a couple, maybe a couple months ago, she hit me up and was like, hey, Ashley, like, I I don't know if this is for you, but it might be, and it was on my heart to share with you. But she was like, I just learned how to save voicemails. And she was like, you can, like, make a folder on your phone. And she was like, you know, I'm telling you this because I know how close you are to your dad, and these are things that I wish I had kept from my dad. And so I literally have like a hundred voicemails saved now. And again, I don't know, you know, when I get there, it might not be for me. I don't know. But I am grateful that I had a friend who thought enough of me um, and knew what she would have wanted someone to tell her. And she she said that to me. And so I'm really grateful that, like you, I have a lot of my dad's voice saved. Um, And I'm just really grateful to friends who can, like, love you in seasons of, like, grief and love you in seasons of like preparing you for a potential grief that could be coming because that's love too. Yeah. Yes, it is. Just like showing that, extending that care and being gentle and tender and saying that like, you may need this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's one thing um, I did. I interviewed my dad a lot when, um, before he Mm. passed. And that was like really great. Just like the stories, because Th- that's where all the memories are yes. held. It's like the stories that we tell each other and just the, you know, all the small things. It's like the photos and the the, the trips that you take together. All these like things come together and that's what makes a life. And you don't want to lose that. So I have, I have scrapbooks, I have photos. I just try to like keep all the things that I'm, that make remind me of my father and all the people that I love in my life because I, I know that's the most valuable. Yeah. You know, we're we're so we're so fixated on like developing generational wealth and building all those things. And that is essential and very important, but it's also valuable to just keep the memories mm-hmm. too. Just like all the all the photos and I just love that. Like I, I'm really grateful I have old photos of my dad from high school yeah. and just like all, all you know, all these things before he was who he was before he got to Howard, yeah. you know, before he had us and um, but you know, my brother and I and I'm really grateful for all of that. And that's like we have to be like almost an archivist of your own. Well, life I was gonna say you sound like me. Yeah. I call myself uh I'm the family historian. Like I have all yes. of the things. I, I've always loved memories. Like I keep little mm-hmm. things like 
Daryl and I just got back from our two year anniversary trip, and like I keep all of like our hotel cards and like all oh, I, I I'm that. so I just keep all of the things. And my dad is the same way. He is so much mm-hmm. from his life. He's made his own scrapbooks of his life, and I'm just so grateful that like um, I I will always have those things. And and my hope is that my future children will have them too. And you know, it's all passed yes. down. It's legacy, like it's you said. All yeah. Down. yeah, and it's. It's the stories yeah. too. It's like, yeah, again, like you know, Ooh. the financial aspect. We, yeah. Of course, we want to have that on lock, yeah. but that's not the story you're going to be telling at Thanksgiving. Listen, you know what I mean. You have to have like the actual or the recipes. Like, oh my gosh, like my also my dad could cook. I miss that. I for sure. Mine too. <laughs> you know, like, I totally miss that. And so, like you know, the recipes, all those things, you need that. That's what creates traditions. Yeah. You know. So yeah, thank you for asking about my dad. I it's so funny. I don't usually talk about him in, in interviews and stuff. Most mm. people like focus on the like books and which I love too. But my dad is the reason why I'm able to like write and do all the things I mm. I'm, I do. I'm so happy you shared him with us. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. I appreciate. What's his name? Oh, so his his public name is Elegance. That's what he went by. Yeah, girl. <laughs> Elegance and glory. Oh my God. I'm yeah. obsessed. When he came to the States, he was like, elegance. I'm sh- I'll share a picture with you. I'll, say- I'll send one over because my oh, dad was dapper. I'm here for <laughs> Mr. Elegance. Yes. yes. <laughs> That's amazing. That And that just makes everything you just said. First of all, I have to tell you this glory. Everything you just said, closing with his name being Mr. Elegance is the most amazing <laughs> full, like, full circle of the stories I've ever heard. So thank you, thank you. I want to ask you, who was Glory when she began, or when she started the well-read Black girl community? And who are you now? What are your hopes and dreams for the community going forward? Uh, That's such a great question. You are good at this, girl. You are good. Oh, (laughs) my God, I love that question. Thank you, sis. (laughs) <laughs> I will say when I started Well Read Black Girl at 2015, I was a young woman that was feeling very driven, ambitious, really mm-hmm. eager to make my mark on the world. I was like just ready to build new friendships, build community. As I said earlier, I was really trying to replicate the world that I had experienced on Howard's campus. And I wanted it to feel just like lush and lively and fun. You know, the literature is at the, like, it's always here and at the top of my mind, but I'm also just trying to like, evoke this experience of joy. Like I want people to have a good time, you know? Sometimes when you're thinking about reading, unlike other art forms, it can seem very solitary. It could feel very academic or or even a little pretentious. And I was just like, no, like we're reading to talk to one another, to just find ways to just like open each other up, you know? Like everybody has an incredible story or memory about when they read The Bluest Eye. And it's like a universal experience for Black women. The, the, the stories that we read or even the films that we watch. Like I, I remember in college, my, my roommate, Jamari, shout out to Jamari. I love you, girl. She's, my, she's one of my mm. best friends. We used to watch The Color Purple all the time. Like if we had a hard day on campus, we would come back to our apartment and straight up. That is the most Howard thing I have ever heard in my entire life. You guys just in the dorm room like this. I promise you, girl, we would put it on color. I don't know what we were thinking. Just put on The Color Purple be on the futon and just like that's how we would decompress (laughs) like seriously yeah and I was just trying to have that feeling I just thought like I didn't think about it as a business per se or even as a nonprofit. I just thought about black women coming together and talking and having a good time like I just was I was new to New York I was really eager to make friends I was finding it a little hard to like navigate Brooklyn and so I'd had a book club in DC so I was like okay I'll do the same thing the only thing that made it you know, really become part of this like 
conversation or this larger conversation is Instagram. Instagram was the thing that transformed it and built its popularity. And like, mm. it, it just changed things. And I feel very fortunate to like set the precedent because now we have so many like black book Instagrammers and lifestyles and like all, all these things started because I was, I had the audacity to like start this book club and people gravitated towards it. And God had a whole different plan. And it like went into a whole other world. I could never, there's no business plan plan I could have written or like marketing mm. plan that allow this to happen. I will not take the credit for it because it just manifested organically on its own. Fast forward now as you know, I recently turned 40 and I drink my water. Yes. <laughs> looking good, girl. We are, we are yes. hydrated. We look good. Um, so, you know, now I am being so like, we are officially a nonprofit that did not, that wasn't present before. Mm. We are a nonprofit. We are like working towards building youth programming. We had our first pilot program for our camp this summer. I worked with these amazing middle schoolers and, you know, took them to art shows and we talked about plays and did poetry. Like I am in this phase and this season, I'm being so intentional about legacy building and making sure that we're pouring into a younger generation because because my ROI isn't necessarily around uh, building capital. It is about like mm. sustaining legacy. So I can encourage these young girls to say, you can go to Howard too. And maybe in like 10, 20 years, they will also be on the New York sellers, bestsellers list, or they will write their own books or create their own works of art or create their own films. Like I am trying to like build and sustain that passion for creativity and literature and learning and like, and also black excellence, you know, so they know that they have these models to turn to. I was very grateful to have models at on Howard's campus in all the books that I read, the women that I've met throughout the book club, they have now become friends. You know, like I, I really do call on them. Like I, we talk on the phone, they came to my baby shower, like they're part of my ecosystem and part of just like the people that I love on consistently. And I want, I want other young women to have that same experience. And so as I grow the festival, we're actually taking a pause. Like we're taking like a rest because so much has been happening. I'm trying to figure out mm -hmm. what the next thing is and how to continue to build out the youth program. But I'm just being, I'm moving a lot slower. Whereas Glory that started in 2015 was doing everything because I was afraid of losing momentum. I was afraid of like losing friends. Like I was just like, there was part of me, I was like, I have to do everything now and get it all done. And now instead, I'm like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to lose anything. What There's like this meme mm. going on right now. I feel like it's Kiki Palmer's voice. And it's like, you know, you can sit and you can rest and what is for you will be for you. I'm paraphrasing. That might be wrong, but it's something like that. Like, it's just like, you can yeah. sit and you can rest and like, you don't have to try to keep up. Like, you can just like do good work sit with it, have have like an honest self-reflection of like what worked and what didn't, and you can keep growing and evolving. And that is the space I'm in. I'm just like, I'm looking forward to, you know, revision and think like writing. I'm working on a lot, a lot of wonderful writing projects. I just don't feel like I'm in a rush anymore. And I feel really grateful for the folks that have come, you know, after me that are doing great things. They're hosting their own festivals. They're having yeah. their own book clubs. They're, they're doing their own things. I feel like we're all part of continu uh, this, like, continuum of, you know, each other. We're supporting each other. We're building each other up. Because at the end of the day, this is art. Like, there needs to be so much art. I don't feel in competition with anyone's art. Like it needs to be abundance mm. of it everywhere all the time. We should be watching more films and reading more books and like seeing so like all of it should be just uplifting one another and, and inspiring us. And if there is another well by a black girl, like, you know, in our miss growing and, you know, maybe she's like three right now, who knows what she's going to do. I don't know. Like, mm. I just want that like, energy to say like you can do it you can do it I did it too like we can all do this together and that is the space that I am now in this season it is no longer trying to rush it's really being more gentle and tender with myself so I can like just give forth the best of of my work and um and really like just offer a, a level of like self-witnessing. Like I want to really, you know, witness all the things and enjoy all the things that I'm putting working for. I just don't want to like 
do it and then go on to the next. I'm like, okay, like, let's see. Let's like actually enjoy this moment, the moment, you know? Yeah. Savor. Oh, that's a good word. Savor. Yes. And surrendering. Yeah. Ooh. Well, that's, everybody knows it's like the theme of my life. I'm always working to <laughs> surrender more. So I love yes. that you said that because it's surrender and it's, it's allowing yourself to enjoy. Yeah. Like you were, you know plowing through in the beginning, trying to accomplish all this stuff. Oh, 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 oh. And now it's like, but you, have, you also have to enjoy it. You have to enjoy yep. the life that you've built for yourself and the legacy that you're building. And that requires surrender and it requires rest. So I love that you said that. So Glory, what has been your takeaway from our conversation today? Oh, that's so good. I, I think the biggest takeaway is just some... Um, it's okay to yearn for the things that you miss, you know? Mm -hmm. So the, talking to you, it just made, just reminded me, like instantly reminded me how much I like miss my dad and miss our conversations and miss those experiences. And I can like give into that. And it's okay for me to like just settle down and say, you know, I really miss my dad today. Like, let me like revisit that and like sit with that feeling and be present in it mm. and being able to value that and not run away from the discomfort that sometimes it also introduces. But it, it felt really good to talk to you about like those mm. good times and all the things that I've um, learned from that loss and all the things that it offered in its, um, in its absence. That's beautiful. M my takeaway is actually something that just kind of happened toward the end, which is like you, you mentioned momentum. And, and I, I think that whether we're conscious of it or not, so many of us are so concerned with our momentum yeah. and rather than be concerned with momentum, I want to be in flow with the plans that God has for me. And yes. I think some, at some, in some seasons, there's a lot of tangible momentum, yes. right? You can feel it. You're on the go. Mm -hmm. Things are happening. Da, 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 da. And there's other times when it when it feels quiet. Yeah. It feels um soft and light and mm -hmm. and and sometimes you can confuse that with not having enough momentum, but when you're in flow with your life and trust the plans that God has for you, um you know that it's always moving. Yes. And it's always moving exactly the way it's supposed to. So thank you for uh, that reminder and allowing me to reframe what momentum means to me in my life. I, I really needed that. I love that. I love, and honestly, the way that you just like phrase that, it just reminds me too that like flow is interchangeable with faith, right? Because like mm. when you have faith in someone, you can be still, you can really just wait for the next evolution and just know that like, What's for you is for you. You don't have to compete with anyone else. And it's, it's, but it's a hard reminder. It's something like you have to actually put into practice. Yeah. Very, very hard. Um, well, thank you, Glory. I honor you. Yeah. Thank you for saying yes. I, I yeah. cannot wait to squeeze you in person. Oh, I can't wait. Um, but you are just a lovely, inspiring woman. And I'm really grateful to now have you in my orbit. Oh my gosh. I am. The feeling is so, so mutual. Thank you for having me on. I'm very honored when I got the invitation. I was beyond excited. So thank you for allowing me to share my story, to talk about my family, to talk about my work. This has been a really incredible experience. Thank you, Ashley. Anytime, Glory. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening. This podcast is produced by LWC Studios for OWN. The show's executive producer is Juleka Lantigua. Our managing producers are Fatima El Swippy and Paulina Velasco. Shanice Tindall is our lead producer. Associate producer is Mona Hassan. Jordan Thompson is our marketing coordinator. This episode was mixed by Trin Lightburn. Michelle Baker is our video editor. If you enjoyed listening to this episode, and we hope you did, please make sure to subscribe, leave a rating, and review wherever you listen to your podcast to ensure you hear the next one.